Thanks so much, Beninder. Can you hear me? I just unmuted myself. Uh, before I get going, I had a quick question we didn't look at before we, when we were practicing. Can you see my pointer on the screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. I want to use that throughout the presentation. Well, excellent. Um, thank you, everybody. And I wanted to thank uh, Meninder and Extension for inviting me to come speak. Um, Meninder and I have been working together for the last three years and some other folks who have presented throughout the series. And we all have a deep passion for soil health and uh, ecosystem management. And uh, so this is exciting to, to speak to everybody today. Um, I, want, I know that we have a diverse group of folks on this uh, webinar. Some people are gardeners, maybe uh, just own some property. Hopefully we have some farmers and ranchers on the call and maybe some other folks who are just interested or um, work in the natural resource management field. Um, I wanted to point out that Although I'm gonna focus on agricultural lands today, um, you know, a lot of these principles can be implemented on the um, home scale and the landscape. Um, I, I even think uh, in ecosystem uh, restoration management as well, um, uh, you know, as we, we think about the idea of, of regeneration, land regeneration. And um, so with that, I'm going to move forward. Oh, and I did wanna say that I'm gonna focus on soil health and soil regeneration, uh, agricultural, uh, regenerative agriculture. Um, there are lots of, lots of soil um, erosion management practice, BMPs that are out there that you may see on non-paved road systems and construction sites and some other larger land management um, um, efforts. But uh, we're going to really look through the lens of soil health today. So um, I don't have, you know, I could, in some of these topics today have already been discussed and I'm going to, you know, just breeze through some of them. Um, some of the slides I have could be an entire presentation within itself. So again, Chuck Shembry here, environmental scientist, and um, I have a large background in agriculture. Um, and I've seen a lot of opportunity for agricultural lands to not only um, play a, a really big role in watershed health, but sequester carbon and, and these benefits as well to improve the, the farm production. Okay, so today's presentation, we're gonna just uh, go over what is erosion, soil erosion. I, I, I wanna be aware that there might be people on this call that aren't too familiar with exactly what, it, what kind of erosional processes out there. So we're gonna go kind of from the basics and then get into some technical stuff. Uh, the, the impacts of soil erosion, because we're gonna focus on soil erosion today, uh, the types of soil erosion in agriculture, uh, important soil properties for reducing soil erosion. So are there, are there soil properties we can look at and as, a, as a, um, a proxy or a metric to evaluate whether our soil um, ha is resilient to erosion or does it have poor soil properties that may indicate that the soil is very susceptible to erosion? So we'll look at some of that. Uh, key soil conservation practices to reduce erosion. We're gonna look at some key soil health indicators that we can use for evaluating the soil. Um, and um, also let's talk about knowing your soil type and, and what, is your, what is the inherent erosion potential of your soil on your site? So what is erosion? Um, well, it's everywhere. It's part of um, being alive just as much as our hair grows or the skin sheds off a, state, a snake, but it's the geological process in which earthen materials, soil, rocks, and sediment are worn away and transported over time by natural forces such as water and wind. You know, soil uh, erosion is beautiful. You know, it's it's our friend. It's part of being um, human. It's part of being an animal. It's part of being on this earth. We have these beautiful landscapes that have been sculpted by erosion that we all love to to look at and appreciate but you know today we're we're going to talk about bad erosion and that's um so there's good erosion and there's bad erosion and soil erosion um is natural in certain circumstances but uh, we've greatly increased it as humans and so we're going to address that today so when we talk about soil erosion it's the displacement of the soil particles sand silts and clays primarily silts and clays that are being displaced from each other in response to the forces of wind, water, and other forces. And these soil particles, when they're transported off-site and deposited, that is when we uh, call it soil erosion. 
So it, soil erosion is very much um, induced by humans and agriculture plays a very large role in this because um, since the invention of the plow, uh, humans have used that as their, into their advantage of, of growing a lot of food crops and fiber across the world. Um, this has been going on for millennium. So um, we're gonna talk about water and wind erosion today. And it's not just mechanized that, um, to the, to the land that can cause soil erosion. We have um, countries and communities and villages around the world, as we see here, that are um, you know, essentially manipulating the land for growing food. And you can see when we have that kind of bare soil on slopes like that, um, even, even by hand, we could expect to see potential soil erosion. Of course, we're all familiar with the Dust Bowl. Um, this is when the United States said enough is enough. We're going to put money into protecting our lands and conserving it. And we had the, um, um, the Soil Conservation um, Service came out of this. And so why did the Dust Bowl occur? Well, we had significant soil disturbance over decades and then uh, significant uh, storm events, wind events, which caused this. And, you know, this caused people to migrate across the United States. It had huge economical impacts to the country. You know, and soil erosion is, 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 has been happening for millennium. And this is a really interesting book um, by David Montgomery called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilization. And he, he explores this compelling idea that uh, for a long time, humans have been using up Earth's soil resources, and that um, we've seen the collapse of civilizations such as Mesopotamia and the Middle East and the Tigris and Euphrates River, where these great civilizations collapse potentially from the degradation of their soil and soil erosion. Really fun book. Check it out. So what are the impacts of soil erosion? There's the environmental, and then there's the financial, and often what is environmental is also a financial burden an expense to countries and communities. So it's just in, in 2006, Cornell did a study that estimated that uh, about $37 billion in productivity losses occur annually in the United States. A lot of that's probably in the Mississippi um, watershed. Um, and then the, the European Union Joint Research Center um, has evaluated that 8 billion in global economic losses happen per year. Um, and this is primarily into crop production and having to increase water usage because we're going to talk about how the degradation of soil reduces a lot of soil function. And I, and I think this has been talked about throughout the other presentations. Um, Pimentel, one of my favorite um, soil scientists, geomorphologists, uh, has said that soil erosion is the second only to population growth as the biggest environmental problem the world faces. And the EPA estimates that 60% of soil erosion ends up in our rivers, streams, and lakes. So being part of the non-point source branch and the water quality planning with the state, uh, we focus on preventing non-point source pollution and sediment. Nutrients in sediment are one of the largest sources. Uh, soil is sediment and soil carries nutrients with it as it is deposited in the waterways. So the National Water Quality Assessment has determined that agricultural runoff and soil erosion is the leading cause of water quality impacts to river streams. It's the third leading source for lakes and the second largest source of impairments to wetlands. So it is critical that we reduce soil from entering our waterways. So here is a picture of what runoff looks like. Uh, people are familiar with this. And if your water is dirty, um, it is carrying soil. If it looks dirty like that, it is carrying soil with it. Oops. Yeah, just another picture here of runoff coming off a field. We want to prevent this from happening. A lot of it, it can be natural. Landscapes have um, features that allow water to flow off of it. So I'm not implying that water flowing off a landscape is unnatural, but we want to keep that soil in place. And this water is carrying, as it erodes, nutrients, bacteria, and other pollutants to the water bodies as it's being discharged off its site. So there's just a nice graphic here that's just a simple understanding of looking at, um, you know, we have a little bit of slope. Water always finds the least path of resistance. 
that might be a stream a river it could be a ditch it could be some sort of concentrated flow on the property and these sediments and uh, nutrients and other particulates are being discharged to the water bodies um, as they flow off the landscape and one of the you know biggest problems we have especially across the west and across the world really is the degradation and loss of aquatic um, habitat and when fine sediments such as clay and silts and fine sands are deposited in the water bodies they um, settle to the bottom as you can see on the right here this picture showing a uh, nice fish habitat on the left you have um, lots of uh, open space in between the uh, gravels etc and then as we have lots of sediments depositing off the landscape they fill in these gravels and um, starves uh, the system of oxygen and it also reduces the um, habitat that fish need to spawn and lay their eggs they're red inside of these gravels so um, this is a big problem and um, we some of the loss of uh, salmonid happened to habitat across the uh, the western United States from Baja California to the British Columbia is mainly due to the deposition of uh, soil and sediment delivery to our stream systems. Um, none other than the most iconic is the dead zone of the Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi watershed is is massive, and it, it it entails some of the largest agriculture in the United States and. Um, it's been happening for decades as we have um, the shedding of, of sediment and, and soil from our landscape that's deposited into the delta. And with the sediment, you know, is there's nutrients and there's bacteria loading, and this has fueled large phytoplankton blooms. And as the phytoplankton die and they deposit to the bottom of the of the uh, ocean, they decompose, and as they decompose, oxygen is is needed to, to for the, the process, which um, so oxygen is being used up in the system, and the system is being starved of oxygen, and therefore um, it is lost the large aquatic loss of, of habitat in that dead zone. Um, and I would like to note that this process happens in smaller systems as well, lakes in particular. Okay, so what causes soil erosion? It's actually pretty simple. Um, fixing it's not simple. It can be in some in some in some ways, but um, it, it's just soil disturbance. or you have poor soil health. Um, then we have strong weather systems, wind or rain, or it could be a large excessive irrigation event that is transporting you know waters moving off the landscape and moving um, the soil with it. And you need some slope. And the soil erosion is. Um, somewhat difficult to have if you have a really flat ground, but it doesn't mean you can't have poor soil health and more potential for erosion if you don't have much slope, but more slope, more potential for soil erosion for sure. So when water's flowing across the landscape and the soil is bare or disturbed, you better bet soil erosion is going to occur. Um, so what are the types of soil erosion? We're gonna get into these right here. These are the basic, um, uh, types of soil erosion that happen on agricultural lands. I won't get into mass wasting. Those are landslides and those happen on much steeper landscapes. Um, you know, uh, forestry is considered agriculture. So obviously we've had massive landslides from clear cutting um, that have happened across the Pacific Northwest. But we're gonna, we're gonna talk about everything above that more so today. So wind erosion, um, Nevada is very susceptible to wind erosion. We have perfect soil types for it. We have very silty and, and fine sandy soils around the, uh, the state that are very susceptible to um, uh, suspension. That's what we are most concerned about when these fine soil particles are lifted up and transported um, into the lower atmosphere. And then just some other concepts, saltation is the lifting and bouncing of like these small sand particles and Surface creep is more of your coarse, larger, like little pebbles and things like that that are bouncing around. And that's pretty natural. That's going to happen in lots of environments. But it's that that suspension, those fine soil particles, we want to keep them bonded. We're going to talk a lot of it, a lot more about that today. So rain splash impact, this is the first process of water soil erosion. Um, very profound, in fact, um, when rain intensity is strong and you have bare soil, you will get this encrusted look. And once you do that, you begin sealing the soil surface and water will be able to start running off of it and picking up energy flow and begin to scour, which is the, um, or 
the first process of erosion generally on a landscape is sheet erosion. And so this is when the soil particles are detached by the rain um, and they begin to flow, you know, the water actually begins to flow down the landscape as a large sheet. It's very subtle. Um, it may be kind of hard to see or not seem like a big deal, but if it's carrying soil particles with it, it is, there's soil erosion. So um, in best case scenario, if we can if we can limit our erosion to sheet erosion on many landscapes, that's fine. And sometimes sheet erosion is just very light, um, but it is more or less a uniform body of water that's very thin that's moving across the landscape. And as it picks up energy, this is kind of an extreme case of sheet erosion, upslope, if we can't see upslope, but as it picks up energy down, it starts concentrating its flow into real erosion. And this is when we start having bigger issues. This is what we want to stop. And we will see this a lot in rain events in Nevada, in particular with these flash floods, you know, people see this, this look of real erosion and might not think it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's the beginning. There's a lot of soil that in sediment that's being moved off site. If you can see real erosion. So um, this occurs when the water runoff begins, like I said, it, it begins to form as concentrated flow and it starts to incise uh, these shallow channels and it, and it starts cutting into the soil. Um, real, real erosion is defined as anything that's about a foot deep or wide or so. Um, and, and remember again, soil water is trying to follow its least path of resistance. So once it starts getting into that rilling, it's starting, it's almost like the way streams flow and it'll start picking up energy. And as it picks up energy, if it's, if rilling is unchecked over time, uh, those rills will become gullies. Like we see in the upper left here, gullies are much larger channels that occur when water is channelized across the landscape first is rill erosion and over time or with intense enough storm the rills form into gullies i've i've actually seen sheet erosion turn into a gully that size overnight on a landscape so um, water is significant at blowing the landscape apart um, and you know in this picture on the top left what we probably have here is a legacy stream channel. It's probably an ephemeral channel. I'm just guessing. I can kind of see the way it would flow. And they're farming over it and tilling it, and you don't see it. But then when a big enough storm event comes, that water, again, it's finding that least path of resistance. And whether you took that ephemeral stream channel away on that agricultural land, uh, water will find its way there. Because there's, there's a subsurface process happening as well that, that we, you know, water's flowing subsurfacely as well. Um, okay. Oh, and just also on the bottom right here, gullies can be so large. Um, sometimes they're just left because it's such an economical issue to fix that people can mistake them as streams. And then they kind of just become sort of a stream, a conduit of water for the watershed. So um, here's just a schematic idea of how erosion begins. You're on the top, mellow, shallow slopes. It's sheet erosion. Hopefully we can keep it as that. But as it moves down slope and you have disturbed soils, turns into real erosion and it picks up energy flow down the landscape and it turns into gully erosion. So stream bank erosion, um, not so much associated with soil health, but it's worth bringing up because we do have a fair amount of stream bank erosion in Nevada and everywhere um, where we have impa impact to the, uh, to, the, to the river beds or stream banks, um, sorry, not river beds, river banks. Um, but stream bank erosion is also natural. It occurs on the outside meander bed known as, as a cut bank uh, in river systems. Um, but it can be um, exacerbated and increased with agricultural activity or other, other activities that are happening, you know, right on and adjacent to the stream bank, whether it's equipment or if you have a agricultural land that has this concentrated flow that's, that's, that's running off of site with high velocities and it begins to scour the stream bank as it's uh, depositing into the, the stream. And you can have a big failure. And also cattle, of course, um, spending a lot of time on the stream banks are going to cause an impact as well. So um, this is something that we do fund under 319H funding with the state is to restore our stream banks and bring back hydrologic function to our rivers. I'm going to get a drink of water here. Actually woke up with a sore throat this morning. It was not good timing, but so bear with me if I'm sound a little crackly. Okay, so the downward, now we're gonna, let's start getting into it here. So how does this all happen? 
the downward spiral of soil degradation, I call it. So it begins with soil disturbance. We have tillage, we have a reduced in, in ground cover or residue, you know, whether it's agricultural or rangeland or even forest land, um, we have disturbance. And as with disturbance, we introduce air and oxygen into the system and we begin to uh, decompose and oxidize our, our organic sorry oxidize our organic matter and 50% uh, of organic matter is composed of roughly 50% of it is soil organic carbon this organic carbon is begins to be released as co2 and organic matter and soil organic carbon is is a strong proxy for soil health and and uh, as this begins to reduce, we lose aggregate stability. We're gonna talk a lot about aggregate stability today. And as we lose our aggregate stability, we begin to reduce the ability of the topsoil to infiltrate water, erosion increases, and the slippery slope happens, and the land beast starts to become degraded more and more and more. And when you're farming, you begin to have a less fertile soil that's not in an ecological equilibrium and um, you're going to reduce your nutrient avail availability and nutrient cycling, et cetera, which I won't get into because we're talking about erosion today, but it is very all related. And then are these systems we have to rely a little bit more on their fertilizer and pesticide input often. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk a lot more about some of these ideas um, later on in the presentation. So first we're gonna watch a YouTube video of, that I put together. Um, Jim Komar showed you a slate test from Ray Archuleta. Ray Archuleta is one of my mentors. Um, he's a superstar that I've been studying since I was uh, really young um, in my early 20s. And um, so I here I'm going to uh, this is a 10 minute video. Hopefully it comes through well. Linda is going to actually share her screen and play it through the browser. I know we attempted this before and um, people had difficulties hearing it. So we'll put the link into the chat. Um, and we did do a test before and it sounded pretty good. So I'm, I've got high hopes. Um, the little premise here, these are soils from Nevada. Uh, during COVID working at home, I decided to put this video together. It was a lot of fun. And um, the soil slake test is a phenomenal test you can do on any soils to check to, you know, not only the soil health, but, you know, its potential resiliency to the forces of water. So. Hope you enjoy this and it'll be 10 minutes and then I'll jump back on. So uh, Linda, um, I will stop I'm sharing ready my to screen. Share. Okay, yep. I'll stop sharing my screen. Hopefully this goes smooth. This is Chuck Shembry, environmental scientist with the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection. In this video, I'm going to conduct a soil slate test to demonstrate how the same soil type under two different management practices and soil management practices reacts under the forces of water and how soil management practices that cause disturbance to the soil reduce the soil's ability to be resilient against the forces of water and how soil that is more disturbed and lacks healthy soil properties is more vulnerable to soil erosion and compaction and can also be a large source of non-point source pollution to our waters here in Nevada. So here I have uh, two soil heads, uh, both are sandy loams and they both came from the, the Nevada experiment station at the University of Nevada, Reno. And they're both the sandy loam. One of them here on my left uh, came from a, a pasture that had been under pasture for 20 plus years, uh, permanent pasture, very lightly grazed. Um, cattle would be rotated through the pasture and um, very limited amounts of herbicides were sprayed on the field probably many years uh, herbicide would never have been sprayed. Um, and then this soil here on the right, which is about 800 feet away from the pasture, is a, a vineyard site that had been farmed, uh, historically had had many crops farmed on it, alfalfa, uh, different crops for research throughout the decades. 
Uh, but in the late 90s, uh, a vineyard was planted and this vineyard was farmed under um, annual cultivation, maybe three to four uh, discs a year to turn the soil over as, a, as weed prevention, mechanical weed uh, management. And also herbicides were sprayed uh, under the vine row to prevent the weeds growing under the vine. No organic inputs were put into the field. The, the, the field was very devoid of living vegetation. No cover crops were planted throughout the duration of this uh, vineyard's life. So therefore, uh, we understand that this soil is not as healthy as this pasture soil. This pasture soil has organic matter upwards to 5% organic matter and this soil has organic matter below 2%. And if we just look at these two, if you can visually see here, see if I can get it focused. This soil here is um, lacks pore space. Uh, you can see it looks like a larger consolidated mass of fine particles and um, doesn't have much complexity to the structure. There's not, um, you know, larger aggregation that's visible. And in this soil here, um, we have a much more definition of soil structure. There's root systems in here, much more uh, living matter. And uh, we, we can hypothesize that the pore space of, of this soil, uh, there's much more pore space. And um, when we put these two soils, submerge them in water in the slate test, we will see what happens to the soil and how it reacts under the forces of water. Uh, lastly, I should note that both of these soils were collected two years ago from, from this time. Um, so they've been, they're very dry. There's no moisture occupying the pore space. And so um, let's see what happens. So what we have here on the left is that vineyard soil that's been under a lot of cultivation and soil disturbance through um, mechanical uh, weed and uh, chemical weed management. And here on the right, we have the uh, fairly undisturbed pasture that's been lightly grazed and um, very limited use of herbicides and very limited soil disturbance. So I'm going to place these two into these jars. Let's see what happens. As we suspected, the vineyard soil, the soil that's under heavy cultivation and disturbance is, um, it's falling apart. The pasture soil on the left is maintaining its integrity, its structural integrity, and it is, has very good aggregation. Uh, the, there's, there's great pore space in the soil. And so the water's been able to occupy the pore space and also percolate through it. Um, this soil on the right, uh, the soil particles are detaching from each other. And if this was in a field and there was a rain event, uh, this, as you can imagine, these soil particles will be transported in the solution. Sorry, they'll be transported <coughs> in the water as, as runoff. And that is often the source of sediment delivery. When soil particles are displaced so easily, because they lack the healthy soil properties, they become suspended in water much more easily to find soil particles such as silt and clay. And these are transported to our streams, our creeks, uh, maybe to the ditch first, then to the stream, and eventually to the river, to the lake, or to the ocean. Um, and again, these are the same soil type, both the sandy loam on the same geomor geomorphological landscape. So through our soil management, we can really improve the health of our watershed. Um, there's a lot of indication about the uh, crop production and crop resiliency under a healthy soil management system. And also many farmers across the United States are documenting economical improvements and benefits uh, 
with healthy soil practices. Well, it's been about three to four minutes. We can see how turbid the soil is in the vineyard soil. And so this is fine soil particles that are being suspended in water and solution. And this is one of the largest sources of non-point source pollution in the United States is uh, soil or dirt that is transported off of disturbed land, bare soil. Uh, so vegetation and ground cover are so important to providing uh, the necessary function for a healthy soil. In the pasture soil, there is always a living root system. Those root systems um, are habitat for soil microorganisms. They are exuding uh, root excavates, different um, amino acids and carbohydrates that the soil microbes are able to feed off of. And uh, that living root system is also providing um, a habitat for mycorrhizae fungi, which live in association with plants. And, and with that will come uh, fungal hyphae, which are these very, very microscopic web-like um, uh, strands that uh, you can actually see with the naked eye as they're all uh, condensed in, a, in an area. You might see it in a compost pile, but these fungal hyphae are really wrapping themselves around these micro aggregates, creating larger macro aggregation, which is um, really important for soil porosity, water infiltration, and water holding capacity. Although in this demonstration, we're using a heavily disturbed uh, soil from a vineyard and a very uh, uh, undisturbed soil from a pasture, uh, I'm not saying that vineyards are a larger issue and source of non-point source pollution. Uh, this is really about soil management. A vineyard can be farmed under um, no tillage systems. It can have covered crops and it can have lots of alternative uh, soil management practices with organic inputs that could improve the soil health and, and, and reduce uh, what we're seeing here with the uh, aggressive, vigorous slaking. All right, hope everybody enjoyed that. And it wasn't too choppy. I'm gonna share my screen again. Let's see here. All right, um, someone confirm or can see my screen? All good, Chuck. All right, oh, let's see here, okay. So important soil properties for reducing soil erosion. I, you know, been alluding to this a little bit along the way. Uh, we're going to dive into that more. Um, but what do we, what do we need to do? What is our, how does our soil need to function to reduce erosion? Well, we need to be able to, have, we need to have good water infiltration into the topsoil. So we need to improve it or maintain it. Uh, we need to reduce compaction or prevent soil compaction in the topsoil primarily. Um, you know, everything we do uh, on the land is usually, to the soil is usually within the top six to 12 inches um, in agriculture, unless you're deep ripping, but you know, a lot of the impact is happening um, day to day on the top uh, six inches or so. We wanna promote strong aggregate stability. We'll talk more about that. And we wanna maintain high soil organic matter or, or whatever a healthy level of organic matter is for that soil type in that climate. So when we look at soil health, we have to consider all three components, the physical, chemical, and biological. But when we're focusing on reducing erosion and mitigating erosion, we can really focus on these two right here, the physical and biological. Um, this was discussed throughout the uh, series, the four principles of soil health. And I think the fifth was brought up probably uh, with grazing or introducing animals into the system 
Um, for erosion, I, I, I try to, you know, let's try to simplify this a little bit and have some targets. I think if we focus on the top two, minimizing soil disturbance and maximizing soil cover, we're going to achieve better resiliency on the land to erosion, um, minimizing continuous living sorry, maximizing continuous living root systems is going to come as a default if you're maximizing soil cover with living vegetation. But we can maximize soil cover without vegetation. We can do that with residues and mulches and stuff that we'll talk more about. So let's get into a little bit of a soil science here. We've got to all become soil scientists. The composition of soil and soil structure. If you're not familiar with the term soil structure, it is a really important um, con. Uh, concept or, or property of soil to begin understanding. Um, but it, I, I know Menindra got into some basics of soil. Um, so, you know, roughly 50% of the soil, give or take, is pore space. And this pore space is occupied, occupied by air and water. And then the other 50%, we think of it as the mineral fraction, the sand, silts, and clays, the inherent part of the soil that um, has been derived through what we call parent material that could be the decomposition of, of rock in place, or it could be the, the depositing of, of sediments from the river flooding, what we call alluvial sediments. So the mineral component is inherent. And then the, you know, roughly 5% organic matter is usually, you know, a proxy for a healthy soil, but it just depends, but you know, some of it is, is organic. But you know, in the last five, 10 years or so, we, we know more about soil microorganisms in the last 10 years than we did the previous history of, of uh, soil science. And so now it's important that we start considering that 50% pore space fraction is occupied by these biological organisms that are playing a huge role in a healthy soil system. I know Jim Komar really um, talked a lot about this. And we're going to get into what is aggregate stability, but first I want to talk about aggregation, the process of aggregation in the soil, which, which creates soil structure. There's a lot of different types of soil structure I'm not going to get into. Some of it is just inherent. There can, soil can actually have, you know, poor, poor, uh, poor so, soil structure inherently, but that's usually in the subsoil, um, but we're in a managed system. So we have this opportunity to create really healthy granular soil structure. And this happens through creating strong macro aggregation. And so in this um, graphic, you can see on the right, um, these macro aggregates, which are all bonded together, and in between them is, is macro pore space. But these, these macro aggregates are composed of micro aggregates. Um, you could see a, ma a macro aggregate with the naked eye, but a micro aggregate, you would need a hand lens and know it, well, what the heck you're looking for. But these micro aggregates are, um, you know, they're glued together. So all of this is, is this, this idea of glue, biological glues are so important. And that's where the biology comes in, plays a, a critical role. So we have to create crit good habitat for this biology so that we can have these glues to bond these fine soil particles together. So at the microaggregate level, we got the sand silts, or we're sorry, we got the silts and clays. And these are being, you know, bonded together by the biological glues and probably some fungal hyphae and, and um, you know, particulate organic matters, really fine fraction of organic matter. And so it's kind of stuck together. It's hard. It's, it's resilient to, you know, to the forces of nature. And then these are glued together to create these, these larger macro aggregates. And we have, that's just this really complex world that's in this, this ecological balance. And you've got root systems that are, you know, channelizing through it and, and, and other larger um, soil biologies moving through it or worms, et cetera. And um, anyways, it's, it's staying, it's, it's a co it, it, there's cohesion or co it's cohesive to, to, to sort of be bonded together with strength. If that makes sense. I'm trying not to get into like a really deep soil. This people are probably committing their entire PhD career to the understanding the development of, of aggregation. So I'm not going there today, but I just want to give us a really more of a fundamental um, idea of it. So this is some really nice looking soil aggregation right here. These are, it's called the granular structure. And this is probably a macro aggregate. And 
all these roots are growing through it. And um, soil, so aggregate stability is a strong indicator for improving water infiltration, nutrient cycling, and just ecosystem function. So you imagine, you know, if, if all of these fine silts and clays are um, not glued together, they're filling in the pore space. And so water infiltration is not adequate. Um, but so, so, so aggregate stability is defined as the ability of a soil to maintain its physical structure, essentially, and withstand the external forces of, of water and wind. Um, it is related to the physical, chemical, and biological properties. They're all working together, um, but it's very sensitive to soil management. So we can use aggregate stability as a um, indicator to evaluate not only soil health, but I think a phenomenal one to evaluate the soil's resiliency to erosion. We'll just quickly look at this, just to really pound this in your head. We got a macro aggregate and you can see all these little micro aggregates that are creating this macro aggregate. And within that, it's got its own fine micro pore space. And when the, the, the macro aggregates are together, like in this picture, we got the macro pore space and now we're getting into the micro pore space and we have all these this you know we have as you know we have there's more microbes in a tablespoon or teaspoon of soil than there is people on the planet so you can imagine what's happening here it's this whole world of um, I think it'd be a great kids Pixar movie actually I've watched Toy Story and stuff like that with my kids I got this idea of, let's just create this an unbelievable Pixar movie of microbes living in a micro aggregate. I think that would be hilarious. So um, there's a lot going on here and we need to respect this. This is where we need to go as land managers to begin not only creating farm resiliency, but protecting our watersheds and, and, and saving a lot of environmental issues is to really respect the biology systems that are at this very minute level here that is so critical to keeping soil resilient to uh, do a lot of stuff uh, as you know drought and the forces of nature. So here's kind of this idea, this framework of components to influencing soil infiltration, because that's really what we need. We need to maximize soil infiltration into the topsoil. We do not want our water just moving off the soil like it's concrete. We need our soil water to infiltrate the topsoil and then it can percolate into that deep soil surface, sorry, deep soil uh, subsoil, and then potentially to groundwater recharge. So this is profound. Preventing erosion could increase groundwater recharge or we know it, it will. Um, so we need organic inputs into the system. Um, that can happen in many ways, but the, the, mic the microbiology is going to help increase those biological, uh, sorry, organic inputs. Uh, they're creating these polysaccharides and these other glues and amino acids and things that are, are, the amino acids are feeding the microbes, but they're creating these polysaccharides and these glues, glomalins that are creating great aggregation. And then if we have good aggregation, we have good infiltration. If we have good infiltration, we have good soil function most likely. Anything can happen. This is all, you know, every site is going to be different, but that was just sort of a generalization of those, of the, of the flow. So let's, here's a nice uh, picture of a healthy soil versus an unhealthy soil or good soil structure versus poor, poor soil structure, or we could say good aggregation versus poor aggregation. A lot of different ways to talk about this. So healthy soil, you can see here, we have good macro pore space, um, we've got residues on the top, good soil cover, good biology, water's flowing through the pore space. It's not inhibited from, from entering the topsoil pore space, whereas the degraded soil or the soil pore soil structure has been disturbed. These, those fine soil particles, those silts and clays, they're, they're not glued together. They're detached. They're being picked up and suspended in that sheet flow or whatever or from the raindrop impact and then they're starting to coat and fill in the, the, these pore spaces and it's you know essentially filling in the pore space almost like we saw in the gravels with the fish and it begins to seal the top of the soil surface 
and then you can see the flow of water there is, is not, the water is sent, eventually will not be able to flow into uh, this soil profile. It's going to run off the topsoil. And, you know, as a farmer, we want as much water stored in our soil as, as much as possible. So this is not just about even soil erosion. We talk about these, these functions of soil health will improve water holding capacity and availability throughout the season, or at least at the beginning of the season, et cetera, potentially reduce you know, the amount of irrigation that's required, um, external uh, irrigation inputs. Okay, so soil organic carbon, very important indicator measurement of soil health. Um, going back decades, scientists have been looking at organic carbon as the proxy for measuring soil health. Now we have all these other indicators, but um, you know, if we have good soil organic carbon in the system, um, means we're gonna have good soil organic matter in the system, means that there's plenty of food for the microbes to function, which means that we probably have strong aggregate stability, which means we probably will have good infiltration rates. So here's a graph that just shows the uh, relationship between increasing organic carbon in a corn and wheat rotation. And they found that as the organic carbon um, increased, uh, water infiltration rates increased. You could probably plot this same graph with, with um, aggregation. Um, you know, strong aggregate stability would, would probably show you that infiltration rates increase as, as aggregate stability improves. Okay, so we just went through some of these um, you know, properties of soil that we can look at and indicators for understanding um, you know, this relationship between soil health and, and erosion control, I guess, for today. So now I'm gonna jump into practices because I think a lot of people are really interested in this and I can't spend a whole lot of time on each one because you know we've had, I'm gonna talk about cover crops briefly. We've had basically two presentations on cover crops. Um, now I could share too, a lot of this today I've done on the land, you know, I've implemented on the land. So I'm willing to speak about this from a practical standpoint, more so today than, than maybe a scientific standpoint, um, but, but it's, all, it's all related. So the farmer is a scientist, as well. So here's some two pictures. Um, that system on the left, this no-till high residue system, um, that is what we're looking for in soil health management practices versus what's on the right, this clean tillage system. It's kind of rebooted every year. Um, it's, you know, and, and versus trying to have this system that's in, um, you know, more in, in, in like a flow state that's got these rhythms to it. And, um, We'll talk a little bit more about that. So essentially a healthy soil has minimal mechanical and chemical disturbance. Oops, let's see here. There we go. Okay. So we're gonna talk, these are the, the ones that are in bold. We'll talk a little bit more about. We'll breeze through some other ideas of um, preventing soil erosion. And again, there are other ways to prevent soil erosion or to maybe to band-aid it. Um, I think soil health or soil conservation practices are the, the key, the root of, of, of mitigating it on agricultural land. So really a conservation tillage, cover crops, residue management, sometimes residue, residue management and conservation tillage go hand in hand, adaptive grazing management, contour planting, buffer strips and filter strips. So, Conservation tillage is essentially tillage practices that build up crop residues on the soil surface to minimize the impact of water and, and wind erosion. Um, because you're not, you know, clean tilling the soil like we, we go back, like we saw to the right here. We're trying to reduce that and have as much complexity and residues and surface roughness through basically with vegetation um, is what conservation tillage is trying to achieve. So in this diagram, I have no-till, it's like the king. You know, if you can get to the no-till system, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're achieving the highest goal you can for, for soil health management. Not all agricultural systems are, um, it's, it's very hard to achieve no-till in many systems. So I'll say that, I'm not gonna, I definitely don't want anyone to walk away and say, everything has to go no-till. Let's make sure we understand that every situation is different, every crop is very different. 
Um, but the other types of reduced tillage we can look at is just, um, you know, reducing the amount of passes you do through the field and an alternative thinking of how you work up the field, um, subsoiling, if you're just need to reduce some compaction in the subsoil that you're not really inverting the topsoil over 100%. Um, strip tillage, so, you know, a certain percentage of the field is, is tilled um, and then ridge tilling. Um, and, you know, and one really big idea for a lot of farmers is just to eliminate end of, at the end of the season fall tillage, like just when the crop's done, if you don't have a cover crop to put in, you don't have to go in and just till the ground over and leave it like a bare blank canvas. Um, we can use all these root systems that are in the soil from the, from the crop to anchor that soil and to continue feeding microbes and to decompose in place and create those channels for the water to infiltrate. So um, when in doubt, if you're able to just to not till going into fall after the crop, that is that would be reduced tillage. So here's a graphic just to um, illustrate what's happening in a tillage system is on the right, we have, we're tilling the soil over, we're disturbing the topsoil to achieve our management goals, but we're introducing air and oxygen into the topsoil. And when that happens, the microbial activity increases. So that doesn't mean that the population of microbes are increasing. In fact, the microbial population can be very uh, non-diverse. Okay, we want diversity in our microbial population, but in a real vigorous tillage system, there might be a, some, some microbial species, uh, that are dominating, but they're, the activity is fast. We're introducing oxygen into the system. And so what they're doing is they're, they start decomposing. They're trying to eat and feed as much as they can. And they're decomposing organic matter and other you know, organic compounds. And, and remember, organic matter is composed, 50% of that is soil organic carbon. So now we've got soil organic carbon that's being consumed by the microbes and it's being respired and it's usually respired as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So we're losing carbon out of the system. Remember, we need carbon to have health, to have good infiltration. We saw it in that um, graph. We need good carbon and organic matter for healthy soil aggregation. So now we start seeing, you know, just the depletion and degradation of our soil health and erosion and soil crusting. And as you can see here, this is just showing there's really not good soil structure. It looks like this large kind of consolidated mass of fine particles. So that's, that's what happens in a lot of these um, heavily tilled systems. And then on the left, the no-till system, it's in this more ecological balance. It's got a living root system. It's got, you can see the layers of the, of the soil is what we want to see. And just, you'd see this in a natural soil system in the forest or the prairie land ecosystem. Um, and you're gonna have good water infiltration. You've got abundance of soil organic matter in the topsoil and, and life, et cetera. And so we're gonna have some, we're gonna have reduced erosion with a soil that looks like this. Conservation tillage, uh, not gonna get into this very much, but there's lots of different ways. We talked about it a little bit. So on the left, we have just a no-till system here of direct seeding into a previous cover crop, it looks like. And up in the middle here, that looks like a corn and soybean rotation with a corn from, you know, the summer it was probably, um, you know, they didn't get rid of the residues. They probably roller crimped it down or, you know, chopped down these residues and left it on the soil throughout the year. And then they came in and no-till seed drilled soybeans. Um, this is a very popular method that's happening throughout the mid Midwest. And on the right, we have what's called strip tillage. So they're leaving these little, you know, they're just tilling where they're going to seed or plant. They're going to probably seed in there. So it looks like 50% of the field is not really tilled and they're lightly tilling. It's not a deep till. And then, of course, grazing and cattle management and, and livestock, there's so much opportunity to, to have no tillage. And that's what we see most of these um, systems in, in Nevada look like. Um, so let's talk about cover crops because cover crops are so critical as a conservation tool. They may be one of the most important tools in our toolbox for a whole plethora of co-benefits for soil health, but especially for erosion. When I got into soil health, it actually started really through soil erosion because I was an organic farmer. I worked on organic farmer, man, we tilled the heck out of the soil pulverize it, stick our hands into it. Oh, it's so fluffy and amazing. 
we planted cover crops though in the winter for erosion control and, and as a green manure for this idea of you know be adding organic material back to the soil this is like in the mid 2000s but things have really progressed and transcended since that point um so you know an organic farming system isn't necessarily healthy if it's under huge tillage so you know we have these opportunities with cover crops to get that soil armor to get that cover to um, reduce disturbance as well uh, so on the top left that's tanner he's the farm manager at dfi and me we're hanging out over some uh, Sudan grass and sun hemp um, that was grown um, during the summer, just trialing it at the Desert Farming Initiative. But there's so much opportunity with summer cover crops. Um, it can be difficult to be growing summer cover crops in this climate when we have little water and farmers can't commit to using water for a non-cash crop. So obviously that's a whole nother conversation in itself. But if you have an a bare ground, a fallow land, or you're trying to rotate your land and, and um, you know, an area, you can use cover crop, uh, summer cover crops, and there's so many co-benefits to them for insectary, just increasing the farm diversity. And there's just a really big window in our climate for summer cover crops. Um, and, you know, you can look, you go online and you look at these seed companies and it's like, this is a summer cover crop, this is a winter cover crop. And you can, expand the mindset you know just getting ground cover during the summer call that a cover crop if you want um you know we were doing at dfi is even letting our arugula after we were done cutting it just sit there and go to flower and and it's maintaining ground cover you know if we weren't going back into that bed um the flowers of a mustard are going to bring insects um we've got soil armor and we're reducing wind erosion because in the summer wind erosion is can be very serious in this climate and then winter cover crops are much more complicated for this climate the window for establishment is very short and the timing has to be precise and mother nature has to give us the goodies to make it work like this fall was incredible uh winter cover crop season for um, to establish uh, cover crops for the winter for this climate we've got abundant moisture and the temperatures weren't too cold, so germination was good. Um, our cover crops have been talked about a lot, so I'm not going to go deep into them. But um, you know, cereal rise and triticales do well in this climate. Um, many legumes can. Um, it is variety specific, so certain wheats and oats can survive the winter here, but not all. Um, quite a few legumes can, but not all. Winter peas don't seem to do too well, but clovers, which is more of a you know perennial or biennial, um, which we see here. There's a lot of success with clovers in this climate. Um, and of course, you're gonna be fixing nitrogen, but you're maintaining that ground cover. And that's really important. And I can't tell you how much a winter cover crop will just transform your soil. Um, I took over a farm in California and it was so degraded. And we implemented just winter cover crops, the tilth and the health of the soil returned within a couple of years. Um, so I think winter cover crops are the most important. And generally, you know, you're, you're, you're farming or you're gardening all season and you know, you're trying to produce everything you can on that piece of land. And then it's like putting it in a rest as you go into winter and you're, you're giving it a cushion, you're giving it a blanket. And, you know, it's just, it feels so good to see your land covered with vegetation um, versus being bare and watching it getting pulverized by wind and water. And it's going to mitigate compaction from that rain droplet. That's very important. Uh, just quickly here, a study that was done by Kansas State University, they just looked at the, um, you see this picture on the left is a field that didn't have cover crops and one on the right that did. And you can see the water coming out a bit more clear on the one on the right. And they found, you can see it was a three-year study, um, rain events varied, but 2016, they had lots of rain and they saw, you can see the, the huge reduction um, the, the cover crop is in green and the non-cover crop is in brown. So with no cover crops, there was much more erosion measured by kilograms per hectare acre. So we know cover crops, they're just going to reduce sediment from moving off the site. And it's, uh, is it reducing runoff? That's a different conversation. Uh, runoff is water moving off the landscape. So you, you know, if you have good soil health, yes, you probably have more infiltration, less runoff. 
or you're going to at least have a reduction in runoff flow velocity. I have seen studies where the same amount of runoff came off of a healthy cover cropped field, but it was, it was clear essentially. So it wasn't not, you know, there wasn't a lot of sediments moving off site. So that's still to be determined, depends on the slope, depends on the soil type, depends on a whole bunch of different things. But we do know that ground cover and cover crops being a tool for ground cover, it filters and it reduces sediment from moving off site. So managing residues, um, just getting that ground covered, it goes hand in hand with conservation tillage techniques. Um, you can chop or mow or leave the root system in place, you know, just get creative, leave that stubble in place. I do that in my home garden. You know, I don't remove the roots out of my garden, my tomatoes. I just cut them at the ground level and I leave the root system in there. And then I just seed uh, my cover crop seed right into the soil and it grows. So you don't have to, there's, you know, it's kind of as human, as, as, as a society, we've gotten to this point where like, well, we got to remove everything out of the field and we got to reboot it. You know, it kind of almost doesn't make sense. Leave the root in the ground. These are some really cool pictures from Frey, uh, Joe Frey and his farming with West, Western State Hemp. Had a chance to go out there this fall and had a, such a fun conversation. But you can see on the right, this was his, he does no-till. He's roller crimping his, his uh, winter cover crop down. Um, he's getting huge biomass. He's been doing this for six or seven years. And then he's no-till seeding with the corn. And then on the left, that's uh, this late fall where he, you know, the corn's been terminated now and it's it's chopped down and uh, mainly roller crimped and he'll come back in and no-till seed drill that uh, for next year's uh, production. And he does a rotation. I don't know what he's going to do this next year. Um, you know, and if you're on the uh, garden scale, you can use residues from your garden. Um, you know, you can take your tomatoes out, let them dry, chop them up, put them back in, or you can, you know, buy some hay and throw it on there, but you know, um, hay will blow away. So you gotta crimp it or wait, you know, water it down or something. Um, sorry, let me go back here. Um, and I think we talked about that enough. Um, adaptive grazing management. I think one of the most profound conservation tools and grazing management tools that Nevada could begin adapting since we have so much grazing, but this idea of adaptive grazing management is to, you know, essentially graze more intensely on a smaller paddock. So instead of this, take this pasture, break it down into paddocks and run more cattle in that space for a very small period of time. So the resting time on that paddock is, is huge. Like we see on the far right here, Knight says, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be 95%. It's just an example. And the grazing time for that year was 5% versus this continual grazing throughout the land of the, the, the vegetation, the, the species that you want to thrive, the deep rooted species in particular, aren't able to, to thrive essentially. And the, the ground stubble is, is low and it's kind of maintained low. And I didn't talk about it today, but it's been mentioned, but photosynthesis is our, our greatest um, tool. That's our greatest um, tool for soil health. So we get that from the plants. We need to keep what's going on on the right. We want the vegetation and the ground cover and all these, this mix of diversity of species to flourish. And when we, um, you know, graze in these systems, we tend to see less diversity. And um, generally the root systems are much shallower because there's less photosynthesis because the ground cover, the plants are maintained at a much lower height. Um, so I'm not a grazing expert by any means. I've been um, uh, studying this and looking at it for a long, for quite a long time. I've worked with livestock and vineyards, but I'm not a grazing expert. So I just wanted you to know that. Um, uh, but adaptive grazing management is a um, amazing tool for, for, for the watershed and for soil health. So some other conservation practices real quick, contour planting. So you can see that the flow of water down the slope. If we plant, if we, you know, run our row orientation across slope like that on contour, it's just breaking up that flow path. So that's a method that's used in a lot of sloped agriculture. Obviously there's a road going up and down here. I can actually see erosion in the bank here. So it's, it's you know, there's some non-paved road work that needs to be done. Um, we're not gonna get into that. And then 
that this is a very profound conservation practice is just having vegetative waterways, you know, or, or sometimes called filter strips or buffer strips can be done in many different ways, but you'll see in a lot of agricultural land where they farmed right through this. And this is where you're going to get gully erosion. So stay off the waterways, let the watershed flow. Um, do not try to control water on the land. If there's, if there's ephemeral, intermittent, perennial, well, obviously perennial streams are huge, but these ephemeral streams that only flow during winter or, or that would be intermittent, but during a, a storm event, uh, we want to keep those protected and, and, you know, if you've got tillage happening, well, you can prevent some of that sediment getting into the waterway with these, with these filter strips. And um, upland, um, here's just a nice picture of like, you know, maybe this uh, dreamy uh, farm landscape where you, you have a 50 plus foot buffer from your waterways and it can be transitioned from the agricultural, if you, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're direct seeding, say lettuce or um, spring mix, how are you going to go no till on that? No one's really figured it out. So maybe this is a, a spring mix farm and they have tillage, but they can implement conservation practices to protect the watershed and the waterways with these buffers and create more habitat. And usually farming right up to the stream bank is just problematic anyway. So most farmers would rather stay off of it once they realize the benefits of it. Okay, I got about 10 more minutes to give us some questions. I think I'm, I'm on track, but I might have to skip some, some uh, slides if I, if I keep chatting so much. Um, let's look at some soil health monitoring. Um, so are there soil health indicators that can be tested in the field or in lab to determine if a soil is healthy or resilient to erosion? Absolutely, there is. We're gonna look at these right here as my favorite to evaluate the uh, soil's ability to res be resilient to erosion, wet aggregate stability, a soil slate test you've already seen, anyone can do that anywhere, anytime, soil organic carbon, water infiltration tests, and bulk density, which is a measure of compaction. So we'll start with bulk density real quickly. Um, soil types are not, um, you know, they have inherent, there's inherent um, bulk densities to, depending on the soil texture. So we understand how to evaluate based on soil texture. You're essentially, you take a, um, um, you're taking a dry weight, um, sorry, you're, you get the cylinder here, you're getting, you're getting the exact volume of soil and it's dried. So that dried weight is divided by the volume to give you this bulk density. Um, and it's basically, it's an indicator of soil compaction. And uh, just, you see this a lot in tillage, um, many tillage farms where, um, you know, the top six inches are being tilled. And so the bulk density is a little bit lower, you know, if you're taking it right at that point, but down in the subsoil below that tillage, that plow layer, um, there's just a buildup of compaction that occurs. Um, so you can see that these, you know, with, with, a, with a silty soil, I mean, if you're getting a, above this 1.65, you have root restriction, you have water restriction, everything that comes along with compaction. Um, uh, water infiltration test, very simple concept. You pour um, a known volume of water into the cylinder and you time it. Such an easy test. You can do this with kids. You can do this at home. But, um, you know, you basically are, you, you got to do it at the same time of the year. It depends on the moisture of the soil, how quickly that water is going to flow through the soil profile. So best not to do it you know, when the soil is extremely saturated because you're probably not going to get much infiltration into it. But um, infiltration tests are great for understanding the um, porosity of the topsoil. And then my favorite, one of my favorite is wet aggregate stability. Um, so wet aggregate stability, it's a, it's a measure of the extent to which soil aggregates resist falling apart when wetted. And, or hit by rain droplets. Um, this here is the Cornell sprinkle infiltrometer test. So it's basically, um, there's a, a known measurement of soil weighted on these uh, sieves and then the water sprinkling over it, a specific amount of water and the amount of aggregates that are left over after this is done is the, it's the percentage of stable aggregates. And so it's a really interesting way to evaluate the resiliency of the soil to um, 
the forces of water, kind of like the slate test. And then a lot of the nations moving towards understanding how do we evaluate the health of the soil through um, these thresholds. And Cornell has been doing this for a long time. They have some good ideas for the northwest, northeastern soils. Um, but just say, for instance, here, um, you know, each soil texture is going to inherently resist erosion differently or be able to bond differently. Uh, so clay is sticky, so it's harder to erode, essentially. Uh, what we can see here is, you know, if you have about 50, if, you have, if you're in the green, you're, if you're somewhere around 50% or maybe 40% of your aggregates are left over, then you have a pretty healthy soil, you're in the green. So there are ways to understand how to interpret wet aggregate stability. And then of course the soil slate test, you guys have seen a bunch of this. And then how about we just use our eyes? Let's take a shovel to our soil, you know? That's my favorite, you know, let's get, if you know what granular soil looks like, you know what good soil structure looks like, you're, you know what worms look like, um, you know, you, the, the smell of soil, let's use our senses to really know if soil is healthy or not. And, and it's very possible to do that. So if you dig into that soil and it's all just kind of falling apart and, you know, and there's really no biology, you don't see like channelization from roots that have decomposed and worms that have moved through it and all these other little micro pores, um, then you probably don't have a healthy soil. Start using your eyes, look around your property. And then soil texture influences the inherent susceptibility of the soil to water erosion. This is very important. So not all soil is created equal when it comes to its ability to resist erosion. So um, for water erosion, essential, um, clay soils are the least susceptible. And then silts are kind of moderate. And silt, you know, silt is basically like powdered sand. You could think of it like it's been pulverized over millennia and so it's not clay. Clay comes from a different type of mineralogy. So clay is inherently different. It's, it's nature, it's properties of its nature is different than silt and sand. And so sand is, you know, larger, everyone knows what sand looks like, but there's different, you know, if you look on the right, we have very fine sands, which are part of fine sediment issues, medium and coarse sands. Um, however, it's the clays and silts that are so small that they're the ones that become suspended in water that are our most, our largest issue to our water bodies. So those, you know, don't settle out as quickly and they stay suspended and then they're more easily transported or they're coating, you know, aquatic habitat and the stream systems, et cetera. So although clay is more resilient to erosion, it's probably one of the worst soil particles or our biggest uh, concern in the waters. And then slope, I mean, I think this is a common sense. Um, the greater slope, the greater potential for water to flow and pick up velocity and uh, have a big erosional event. There's different types of slopes as we see down here. So, um, you know, evaluating if you have a more complex landscape, you need to approach it and with more uh, dynamic mindset. Um, so with all things being equal, soil erosion and runoff will increase with increased slope. But, you know, if you have above 5% slope, that's when erosion starts to become a concern. Uh, when we get above 20 and 30% slope, there's just real high potential for some serious erosion. And just this graph on here just shows this trend as slope gradient increases, um, sediment yield rates increase. Quickly, uh, you can look up your soil type using the web soil survey. Um, you know, this is painted with a very broad brush, but you can get an idea. This is the agricultural experiment station where I took the soils. You can look up the erosion rating by going to um, this um, soil data explorer and, you know, take some time to figure this stuff out. Folks at the NRCS really help people get their soil information. I can do that as well. I know how to use this web soil survey. Um, so, you know, you can find out your erosion rate. There's erosion ratings that are, um, I won't get into how those are determined, but each soil type has a erosion rating. And as this erosion rating increases in number, it just means that the soil is more susceptible to erosion. And we can, you know, for a long time, we've been um, calculating soil erosion. The universal soil loss equation, USLE, was created in 1965 to determine, you know, a site's um, soil loss. 
Um, so not necessarily erosion, but the idea that soil is, uh, particles are being displaced and moved a certain amount of distance on the landscape. So, and then the Russell uh, and Russell two was created, um, which is a little bit more um, comprehensive way to measure soil loss and soil erosion. Um, these are actually fairly easy to do once you uh, learn how to do it. Um, more of a conservation tool, not really probably something you need to do as a homeowner. But I just wanted to um, show this to everybody that there are ways to calculate soil erosion and there are other methods as well, but these are two that I wanted to highlight. And oh, real quickly, just, you know, we were looking, each soil has a soil loss tolerance that the, has been determined by the NRCS. You're, you're measuring rainfall energy, the erodibility factor, which we just talked about, this LS is the slope length and the slope gradient combined. And then we look at the crop management, other, you know, what do we have on the land? And then the P is like the orientation of the slope or different erosion control methods that are put in place. So I'm wrapping it up here. I hope this has been um, informative. I look forward to questions. I wanna leave it at this. We look at this rainfall simulator here and on the left, we see these runoff buckets that have nothing in them. We have this, um, well, it says overgrazed pasture. I actually didn't realize that, managed pasture. Okay, but we have very little runoff off these vegetative sites. And on the back, you see the infiltration. So there's more pore space. There's more infiltration of these healthier soils with these living root systems. And as we move to the right, we have more disturbed soil, less ground cover, and just in this demonstration, which is a great demonstration for what's happening in real life, we have more runoff. We can see the amount of sediments with that runoff, generally less infiltration. And on the far right, that's just a um, roof shingle. So, you know, we, we, we take care of our soils, we start taking care of our watersheds, we're taking care of our precious water for, for our drinking, for even for our agriculture, for aquatic life. Okay. And uh, just quickly, nice little quote here. The nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. You've all heard of that. We've been celebrating soil now for years. And um, let's uh, keep taking care of our soil. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chuck, so much for your time and excellent presentation. And I hope all of our attendees learn about the erosion, its types, and the conservation practices to reduce the erosion from the field and agricultural lands, which is very important to maintain the soil health. So before we take the questions, let's go to the polling section. And so far we got two questions. So 